Thank you for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rana al Kayubi. I'm Affectiva's co-founder and CEO. Uh, Affectiva is an MIT spin-off, and we are on a mission to humanize technology. Um, my journey started um, over 20 years ago, where I, I grew up in the Middle East. I was born in Cairo, and then we moved around in the Middle East. And then I had the opportunity to move to Cambridge University to do my PhD in computer science, specifically in machine learning. And I get to Cambridge, and I realize I was spending more time with my device at the time than I did with any other human being. I know, it's kind of sad, right? <laughs> uh, but I don't think I'm the only one. Um, but it made me realize two things. First, that this device had absolutely no clue how I was feeling most of the time. It knew a lot of things about me. It knew my location, what activity I was doing. Um, it, knew, it knew who I was, but it was completely oblivious to how I was uh, feeling, my emotional state. The second kind of aha moment I had was that this device was my main portal of communication with my family back home. And oftentimes, I would be really homesick, I would be stressed and upset, and the best I could do was send a little emoji with like tears, <laughs> you know, over chat. And I felt that all of the richness of our nonverbal communication and the nuances of our emotional experiences totally got lost in cyberspace. So that got set me on a journey to build computers that have empathy and have emotional intelligence. Um, and you know, I, I, after Cambridge, I joined MIT Media Lab as a, as a research scientist, quickly realized that there were a lot of commercial applications of the technology, and so we spun out. Today, AI is ingrained in every aspect of our lives. It's becoming mainstream, and it's actually taking on roles that were traditionally done by humans, acting as your personal assistant, helping with your health care, driving your cars, helping you hire your next coworker. The problem is we need this new social contract that defines our relationship with technology, one that is built, in my opinion, on mutual trust. If you think about the rhetoric around AI, it's all about should we trust in this AI? I encourage you to kind of flip it on its head. Should AI trust in humans? It's not that we always have the track record of doing the right thing. If you think about what's going on, like trust has already gone wrong in many cases. You know, chatbots that have turned racist on Twitter overnight, uh, self-driving cars that are being involved in fatal accidents, and facial recognition technology that discriminates against minority groups, especially women of color. So trust is a social contract. Sometimes it's explicit, like we need all these terms and conditions and license agreements, but actually most times it's implicit. It's manifested on the nonverbal communication and empathy. Empathy is right at the center of building trust. It's one of the themes that I'm hearing over and over um, at Ideas Festival, um, and I really believe in that. But if you look at technology, we're very focused on the cognitive intelligence of these devices, the IQ, and nobody's really thinking about the EQ. And we know from years of research that your emotional intelligence matters. People who have higher EQ tend to do better in life. They're more successful, they're more trustworthy, they're more likable, they're more persuasive. And I believe that that's fundamentally true for technology as well, for technology that integrates and communicates with humans on a daily basis. So that set me on a journey to build technology that can read human emotions, um, just as humans can. What if our computers could tell the difference between a smile and a smirk? Um, they both involve the lower half of the face, but have very different meanings. Imagine if your learning apps, intelligent learning systems, could understand or gauge the emotional engagement of the learner and personalize the content accordingly. When you walk into a doctor's office today, you don't get asked what's your temperature or what's your blood pressure. We measure it. But in mental health, the gold standard is still self-report on a scale from 1 to 10. How depressed are you? How suicidal are you? How much pain are you in? And I believe, I'm very passionate about this, that it's time that we bring in objective data, longitudinal objective data that can help us quantify mental health and interfere and kind of help early on. So that's one of the use cases of this technology. But really, the merger of this IQ and EQ in technology is inevitable, and there are so many applications of this technology, um, which makes it kind of interesting for a young startup like us to kind of really prioritize the different applications. But then how do you build a computer that can read these dis displays of emotions? People communicate in a variety of ways. You use gestures, you use vocal intonations, and of course we use our face. 
Um, the face is one of the most powerful canvases of communicating a wide range of emotional and cognitive states. Um, over 200 years ago, this guy called Duchenne used to electrically stimulate people's expressions to, uh, or facial muscles to study expressions. We do not do that anymore, thankfully. Um, and then in the 1970s, a researcher called Paul Ekman and his team published the Facial Action Coding System. It is a methodology to map every facial muscle to an action, to a code. So for example, if you pull the zygomatics muscle, as in smiling, you should all try it. Um, that's action unit 12. If you do a brow furrow, that's action unit four. Um, there's about 40 of these action units. It takes you about 100 hours of training to become a certified face coder. And then about five minutes to every minute of video to code, um, to code a video. So you essentially watch the videos in slow motion. You say, oh, I see a smile, I see a smirk. Very laborious, very time intensive. So what we've done is we use computer vision and machine learning to automate this process of face reading. And I thought it would be fun to try a live demo, um, which are always, always interesting. <laughs> um, but I need a volunteer with a face, somebody with a face. <laughs> so who would like to try this? I am not going to be tweet. OK, awesome. We have a volunteer. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, coming up. And can we switch to the iPad, please? All right. So I'm just using the camera on the iPad. I'm not recording any of this video on, on the device. I'm not sending it to the cloud. No, no, you can come over. We're going to do this live, yes. All right, so you hold on to the iPad. Lori? Yes. OK, hi, Lori. Hi. All right. Um, OK, start with your best poker face. All right, great, <laughs> and keep it, it's tough, I know. Um, so you can see that the technology has immediately identified Lori's face. It's also identified the main feature points on your face, your eyebrows, your eyes, your mouth. And based on how you look, it maps your gender to female. Um, that's good. <laughs> you never know, so I have to be very careful how I say that. All right, so. Um, and you're, you're, you're smiling, and it's detecting your expression of, you know, it's mapping your smile to, to joy. We're going to debate that, I assume, on the panel. Um, but let, let's, try, let's try these. So eyebrow raise. Wow, that's great. It's also mapping Lori's most dominant expression to an emoji. How about brow furrow? Oops. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Smirk. So a smirk is an asymmetric lip corner pull. So there you go. Yeah, there. Nose wrinkle. Yeah, you're also wrinkling your nose a little bit, too. Um, and then lip pucker, just for fun, which is the Kardashian duck face. Yep, there you go. <laughs> Great. There's about 20 of these different expressions that we're able to detect. We're only showing six for simplicity. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Actually, let me put that all the way back. This app is just to kind of bring to life the technology, and hopefully your minds are already thinking of some of the use cases and applications. Can we switch back to the slides, please? Um, this, this app is available in the App Store, and you can download it and play with it if you're interested and try to break it, too. Um, so the way we train these algorithms is we uh, inject hundreds of thousands of examples of different expressions, smiles, smirks, eyebrow raises, etc. And using deep learning, the neural network actually looks for patterns of commonality between each expression. And it learns these different emotions or different expressions of emotions. When we first started, um, we were able to only identify three of these. You know, smile, eyebrow raise, brow furrow. We now have over 20 different facial expressions, seven emotional states, things like cognitive states, like attention, fatigue, distraction. Um, and we're continuously adding to the repertoire of um, expressions that the technology can detect. Uh, we've amassed a ton of data through this exercise and very interesting insights that maybe we can talk about in the panel on what we've learned from this data. So we've have 8 million faces in our database of people emoting across the world. It's a very diverse uh, data set. Which brings me to one of the main concerns I have about the kind of the development of these AI technologies. And, and 
I'm not concerned that robots are going to take over the world, I, but I am very concerned about accidentally building bias into these technologies. Um, we've already seen you know, these facial recognition technologies being very biased against certain groups. And the way to think about this is if the data is biased, the algorithm is going to be biased too. So we take a very mindful approach in sampling for diversity when we're training the algorithms. So here you're seeing how the smile classifier is being trained. There's equal um, kind of, you know, equal samples of females and males are, they're not exactly equal. It's very hard to exactly balance the data set. And then there's some representation of different ethnic groups. And when we look at the accuracy of these classifiers, it's the same thing. We, look, we don't just look at a general accuracy number, we break it down by gender, ethnicity, age, et cetera. And I want to take this opportunity to kind of pu put a plug in for the diversity, the importance of diversity in people who are designing these AI algorithms. Um, our team is very diverse, not just age and gender and ethnicity, but also backgrounds and experiences. So we don't just have data scientists and machine learning machine learning scientists. The, I know, it's hard. <laughs> sure. I feel like I'm like exercising. Um, <laughs> um, but diversity is very important. So diversity of experiences too. So we have psychologists and um, artists, art historians on our team who are also kind of lending their perspective on how we think about these algorithms. So where is this technology being used? There is a lot of applications, as I said. Already 25% of the Fortune Global 500 companies use this um, day in, day out to test how people emotionally engage with their content. Um, and it's done, it's very scalable. So you might get a survey on your phone. It asks you to turn the camera on. If you say yes, camera turns on, you watch, you know, a Netflix show or a, you know, a Coca-Cola ad, and we're like looking for your subconscious, visceral, emotional reactions. And we found that this data correlates very highly with consumer behavior, like virality, or do you actually buy the product or not? Um, this is also being used in hiring. That's a whole other conversation to reduce bias. People are very biased um, when they're hiring because it's very hard to decouple um, kind of our implicit biases around um, yeah, eth you know, race and, and gender, whereas the technology is both gender and ethnically blind. And so there was a huge study that one of our partners, Hireview, did with Unilever that used this technology and, and they found that they were able to increase the diversity of their hired population by 16%. Um, you could also use the same data to help people improve their interviewing and negotiation skills and management skills just to be more empathetic. Um, or public speaking, so you could practice with this machine, right, that's not judgmental and patient, um, and it could say things like, oh, like you've said um, 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 a hundred times, or you're not making enough face contact, um, and it, you could track how you're doing better over time. One of the really kind of interesting and fascinating use cases of this technology is in automotive. So we're partnering with a number of companies to bring this to our cars. And I want to show you a couple of examples of data we've collected from drivers uh, with their consent. So they know that there's a camera in the vehicle. And this is what we got. So this is a dad driving. <clears throat> the technology is actually tracking both him and his daughter. He's clearly asleep. Um, this video goes on for a good five to seven minutes, um, and it's extreme drowsiness. Very easy to detect just by looking at the blinking behavior in the head pose. Um, you could imagine how the car can intervene. Um, you know, over time, the car can actually take control over and say, you know what, I'm going to be a safer driver than you are right now. I'm taking the you know, control over, but there's a variety of things the car can do. Here's another example. Again, these are people who know that there's a camera in the vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> so again, extreme example of distraction. <laughs> so her eyes are off the road, her hands are off the wheel, using a, a combination of computer vision, but also object detection to determine that she has two phones in her hand. Again, the car can intervene and, and um, you know, give alert or escalate um, action. 
So we're doing a lot of work in that space. We're also partnering with robotic companies to bring this technology to mental health. As I said, it's an area I'm very passionate about. Um, and, and there's a lot of use cases there. One of the very early applications we explored Please, yeah. for this technology was autism. Eight-year-old Matthew Krieger has been diagnosed with autism. A lot of the trouble he gets into with other kids is he thinks he's funny and doesn't read at all that he's not or that they're annoyed or angry. Matthew's mother, Laura, signed him up for a clinical trial being conducted by Ned Sahin. I want to know what's going on inside the, the brain of someone with autism. And it turns out parents want to know that, too. You get points for looking for a while and then even for looking away and then looking back. Sahin's company, BrainPower, uses Affectiva software in programs Matthew sees through Google Glass. These games are trying to help him understand how facial expressions correspond to emotions and learn social cues. One of the key life skills is understanding the emotions of others. And another is looking in their direction when they're speaking. Looking at, at your mom, and while it's green, you're getting points. When it starts to get orange and red, you're, you'll slow down with the points. Am I looking at you? You are looking at me. Just a few minutes later, the difference in Matthew's gaze overwhelmed his mother. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Why? <laughs> when you look at me, it makes me think we haven't really before, because we're looking at me differently. <laughs> So our partner, Brain Power, they have about 350 of these Google Glasses deployed with families. We already know that the kids, while they're wearing the glasses, we can see an improvement in their eye contact and face contact and understanding these basic kind of expressions. Um, the, the big question is, once we take away the glasses, are they generalizing these skills or not? So that's one of the questions that they are um, kind of exploring. So hopefully by now, you're thinking of a lot of applications. Some of them have potential, transformative potential for humanity, but some are probably freaking you out. <laughs> um, so we think a lot about this ethical deployment of AI. What kind of industries do we entertain, not just as a company, but as a, as a community and thought, thought leaders in this space? We have very strong core values where we have turned you know, over $40 million of funding um, to take this technology to surveillance and security and lie detection. Um, I feel like it, it would break the trust we've built with, with our consumers and our, our users. Um, so, so that's something we feel very strongly about, and I feel very strongly that we as a community need to get together and decide what are the rules of engagement and what are the rules for ethically developing and deploying this technology. And so I'll just leave you with a thought. Let's make AI not about the artificial, but about you know, the human needs and how it can serve us. Um, yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. So if you want to take a seat. I do have water for you, <laughs> thank you. of course. Um, and we'll, we'll bring up some of the other panelists shortly. Uh, I guess I want to start. I do want to go back to the, the question of bias, because that's a really rich topic in this field right now. But before that, <laughs> a more general question, which is how do we figure out how to think about this kind of technology and, and how on one hand, you see like if, if there's a way to prevent distracted driving, if there's a way to help an autistic child understand how to be successful in the world, those feel like objectively good things. Um, when it's a Coca-Cola, a smart TV mm -hmm. watching my face react to a Coca-Cola ad and then telling Coke, I, I become a little more creeped out. So yeah. how do you think about the applications and where we as a society should feel comfortable or not? Yeah, absolutely. I, I am a big believer. Everything, of course, has to be done with people's consent. And I think people ought to like own their data. But I don't think that's enough. There has to be some value in it for you as a consumer who's going to share this very, very personal data. I mean, it doesn't get more personal than your emotional data. Um, so in the, in the advertising use case, we pay people. Like we, you know, we, we compensate people for sharing this type of data, and that's totally fine. You know, some, you know, a lot of people opt in to do that. With the driving, the value proposition is that this will be a safer for you and your family. Um, but there always has to be a value proposition back to that person. And I don't think we've, as a tech industry, we've always gotten that cost value equation right. And humans generally, <clears throat> excuse me, tend to be pr quite good at reading sort of discrete facial cues. And it's, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit more about the mapping. Um, 
And, and sort of the nuances. I mean, certainly there are more emotional states than can be reflected in however many emojis there are. Right. Um, and, and there is a, a difference in how one person might express joy to the next. I mean, the joker smiles. And that doesn't mean he's happy. It means he's yes. crazy, a supervillain. Right. Um, so how do you look at sort of the, the, the range or the spectrum of, of human emotion and how it's conveyed and, and how to interpret it if it's a machine um, sort of running the show. Yeah, a couple of things. First of all, I want to cl clarify, we're not like reading your innermost feelings, right? We are like reading outward displays of, of emotion, of outward, dis outward displays of behavior, right? These could be social signals for communicative purposes, or they could be truly reflecting your inner state. Um, you know, sometimes that's the case, sometimes that's not the case. But we're very interested in this human behavior, these outward signals that we choose to portray um, because they, they carry a lot of meaning. Um, and then, you know, the mapping back to the emotions, that's a very challenging problem. I mean, humans don't always get it right. And we amass a lot of information. Like we, you know, we consider multiple modalities. We listen to the people's vocal intonations. We watch their expressions. Often you um, borrow information from, you know, if you know the person, if you've known the person for many years, you have a lot more contextual information to draw on as well. Um, so I would say the technology is very, it's, it's, it's in its early days. We have a long way to go. I know um, you mentioned when our uh, volunteer came up for the demo, thank you again for that, um, that you asked her to do her best poker face. Have you uh -huh. tried to apply this technology to like the most inscrutable populations of people, like uh, poker players? <laughs> we've been, we've been approached element? by the gaming industry, but we have not. We, yeah, we, we have not applied it uh, to poker players. Interesting. Um, what are some of the other most sort of inscrutable uh, facial expressions or, or the ones that sort of bleed into one another in maybe surprising ways? Um, I mean, we do a lot of testing. This is not exactly an answer to your question, but <laughs> we do a lot of testing in Hollywood and there is a, a disproportionate amount of Botox and our technology does not work if your muscles can't activate. So, um, so that, that, I mean, that's, that's, that's a challenge. Um, that's great. Um, going back to the question of algorithmic bias, um, mm -hmm. I think, and tell me if I'm oversimplifying it, but in, as a tech reporter, uh, I covered this issue often, and it seemed like there are two kind of main modes of algorithmic bias that people talk about or worry about. One being the models that don't actually reflect reality, so that's mm -hmm. a model that you develop that doesn't actually detect um, it with as much sophistication people with darker skin. I know mm -hmm. you mentioned women of color specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and the other being a model that would bring in the prejudices of the people or the system that built it. So that's the example where you may have read about um, a hiring algorithm that doesn't suggest hiring or doesn't recommend hiring women because all of the data has been men. hiring men more than women. Right. That doesn't mean the women aren't qualified. It just means that the human, um, the humans making the decisions before weren't necessarily or, or were bringing their own prejudices. So, talk a little bit about a little bit more about which of those two modes or or other forms of algorithmic bias are most sort of concerning to you, or sort of where do you see both? both yeah. yeah, both are very concerning. And um, I mean, it's often a blind, it's not done on purpose, it's just done accidentally, right? Like people are not, or the folks who are designing these systems are not being very mindful about kind of the process of training and building these systems and testing them and validating them. I'll share a couple of examples. So, you know, we have about 8 million faces in our data set. Our team of annotators, um, the, fa the certified fax coders, they're based in Cairo, Egypt, where I'm originally from. And a lot of them are women who wear hijabs. Hmm. And, you know, they code these videos day in, day out. And one day they all got together and they wrote us, and you know, they wrote kind of the Boston headquarters an email and they said, you know, we have seen thousands and thousands of faces and we've never seen any women wearing the hijab. Now, it may or may not influence the algorithm, but it was interesting. We wouldn't have thought of that sitting in Boston. Do you know what I mean? And that's an example of a blind spot. Another example, we work very closely with a German luxury automaker, luxury automaker, and we had a proof of concept with them where we were looking at drivers, and they were on the hook to collect data, and we were on the hook to analyze the data. So we get the data after a couple of months, and we go through it, and it's, it was collected in Poland, and it was all, you know, 30-year-old, very, very blonde guys. <laughs> no women, no diversity whatsoever. And we went back to them and we said, A, we could have just analyzed the data and, you know, and just you know, got our money. 
But we took a stance and we went back to them and we said, you know, you are a global automotive maker. You're going to deploy this around the world. If we just train our algorithms based on this small data set of very, very, you know, homogeneous um, drivers, the algorithm is going to be biased. So we, so we went back and proposed a global strategy to collect data from multiple countries around the world, um, you know, in, in, a, in a very thoughtful way to mitigate this bias. So what about <clears throat> the cases where, you know, we can go back and look at a model that's been trained on all blonde guys from <laughs> Scandinavia, <laughs> or we can go back and look at how many women were actually hired based on this algorithm's recommendations. But what about the things that we don't know to measure that could be informing the way these models make decisions or recommendations? Yeah, that's, that's why I'm a real huge advocate for diversity and inclusion on these teams, because we, we, d we solve for the problems we know, right? Um, and so you want diverse perspectives around the table to say, hmm, have you thought about that issue, you know? And, and yeah, so I, I think that that's really critical and we're not there yet. Okay, great. We're gonna bring up some of our other panelists. Um, Elizabeth Dunn, a professor of psychology at the University of British Columbia, as well as Nicholas Upley, the director of the Center for Decision Research at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. So um, thank you both for being here. Give them a moment to get settled. Um, and Elizabeth and Nicholas, we've sort of talked about the realm of, of facial recognition, and we're going to move for a moment into voice, which I know you've both thought a lot about. Um, Liz, maybe we can start with you. Uh, you know, we've seen these machines that can, or these uh, models where a machine can detect, detect happiness on your face, um, but can they hear it is a question that you've been interested in. Can you talk a little bit about what you've learned? Yeah, so we were pretty excited about some of these ideas that are emerging, these claims that you can automatically detect emotion. And so I'm a happiness researcher. My job is to study what makes people happy. And so it would be amazing for me if I could just like automatically know how happy all of you are throughout your day, that would be great. Um, and so, you know, a, a, a really interesting way to do that potentially is because everyone's carrying around smartphones, we can record clips of their voices and then um, potentially use the really rich information that's contained in the voice to um, get a pretty good guess, we, we would hope, about how happy they are. So we did this, we got about 100,000 um, voice clips and actual mood measurements. So we asked, asked, found out how people, how happy people really were in that and moment. And is this people on phone calls or what kind we of? We did it, we've tried it several different ways. So ranging from someone just saying, this is the sound of my voice today, which is like the really minimalist end, all the way up to somebody talking for a full minute about their day that day. Um, we've, yeah, so we've tried a variety of ways. Um, and I can summarize the results succinctly by telling you that we got a big fat nothing. <laughs> there is, we found zero predictive power. And we had like amazing computer science folks. We had like some of the top emotion people working on this. And we just saw nothing. So, you know, there's something we're doing wrong, I guess. Um, but we could not find it. Um, and I want to go back. I want to get back to why this might be and the implications. But Nicholas, maybe you can first talk a little bit about your work and and, and sort of why human voice is so crucial to our our ability to communicate well with one another. And just what's your why is it that humans can rely on voice communication when other realms of communication, which were largely reliant on in the sort of text message age, voice remains really potent. Um, why is that? Yeah, so what, I, mean, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind as audience members here is that we're all studying sort of different parts of this social judgment problem. Um, so what you've heard so far is trying to understand people's actual emotional experience from their faces or from their voice. I study the other side of the social interaction, uh, which is the inferences that you make about somebody else when you're in the midst of interacting with them. So the judgments that you make about what somebody might be thinking or feeling or so on. Uh, and we know that people take an awful lot of information from other people's behavior, what they see them, see them do. We also know they take a lot from a person's uh, voice. And so what we do is we study how different mediums of interaction 
uh, affect the kind of inferences that you form about somebody else. I'm most interested in the inferences that you make about somebody's mind, or how thoughtful, how intelligent, how rational, like how human-like they are. And what we find over and over again is that these different media communicate mind very differently. In particular, what we find is that the voice really contains a lot of information that you take about the presence versus absence of another person's mind. When you hear somebody speaking, they sound, we find over and over again, more thoughtful, more intelligent, more rational. You can hear them thinking as they're speaking naturalistically. We don't necessarily know about accuracy. That's a different, that's a different kind of question. But we know about the inferences that, that you make. When you strip that out in text, so when you strip the voice out and you're just communicating uh, with, with text, we find that people seem less thoughtful, less rational, less intelligent, less mindful. When you strip the voice out of interaction, you also strip out the perception of another person's mind. Well, and there bit. are nuances, too. I mean, I know I've had debates with my colleague about whether ending a text message with a period means you're mad, <laughs> right. which is, I mean, such a small thing that, that for many people they're drawing meaning from. Um, Nick, maybe you can talk a little bit about the experiment that you did in 2016. Yeah, so we ran some, uh, run some, ran some experiments just on the eve of the last presidential election, which uh, I, I presume most of you will remember the outcome of that one. <laughs> Um, and so what we did was we brought in Trump and Clinton supporters the, the weekend before the election on Tuesday. And <clears throat> we had them explain why they were voting for their chosen candidate. As everybody in this room knows, the natural tendency these days, uh, not necessarily these days, it's been going on for a while, is to sort of dehumanize the people on the other side of the political divide, not just to think that they think differently than you do, but to question whether they can actually think. That is how smart, how intelligent, how competent, how capable of feeling are the folks on the other side. They seem sort of like idiots uh, to most of us. Um, and so what we did was we had people either type an explanation of why they were voting for their chosen candidate, or we had them tell us verbally. Uh, and we recorded it. We took an audio tape, uh, audio videotape. We stripped the, out the video. We just used the audio, or we transcribed it into text. So we now have two media that have voice and two media that don't. We didn't find differences between the media within voice and no voice. And what we did was then we had Clinton and Trump voters watch or read these statements and just judge how human-like you were, how sophisticated, how rational, how intelligent, how thoughtful, how emotional, how capable of emotional experience are you. And what we found was that the tendency to dehumanize the other side mainly emerged when you were reading what the other side had to say. When you actually heard the other side explaining their point of view, they seemed a little more sensible to you, seemed a little more rational. Now, these are different, it's important to recognize, these are different kinds of judgments than the ones you've heard discussed here so far. These are judgments about your mental capacities, and we find that the medium through which people communicate seems to matter a whole lot. A lot of the modern technology that's stripping voice out of interaction strips some of the humanity out of it as well. Exactly. I, I mean, I, I, I really believe that a lot of the rhetoric of the political dialogue we're seeing online and the bullying and all of that is because we're dehumanizing each other because we're just, you're just sending texts and you, you don't see how it's being, you know, how it's being, um, what the reaction is on the person on the receiving end. And that's one reason why I believe Emotion AI isn't just about like building computers that can inter you know, interact with us better, but it's actually about better human to human connections because so, we all communicate online. So if Twitter required you to FaceTime with everyone you were tweeting to, we'd all be nicer to each other? Or, or, at, least, or at least you, know, you tweet and then, and, then, and then you get like a, a score kind of you know, on, on the effect you had on people. You right. upset, like, I don't know, you upset 10,000 people right now. Right. Or you hurt 10,000 people, right? <laughs> I want to go back to Liz for a minute. Um, your focus on voices, I think, on voice, I think, is particularly fascinating at a time when, when people are defaulting to text mm -hmm. for communication online, text messages, um, you know, work based chat platforms, whatever the case. Um, and it's also at a time when humans are increasingly getting comfortable talking to machines and conversing with machines that don't understand them. Um, what is it about this moment that makes voice sort of, you know, it's, it's diminished in some places of society and then, um, and then we're talking to our machines more than ever? <laughs> right. Um, well, I would say that, uh, you know, 
there's perhaps an opportunity with these devices that now speak to each other to, uh, and that we can speak to, to actually help, help us communicate more effectively. So if there's any like Amazon people in the room, I have this <laughs> profound desire to be able to set my Alexa so that when my son, six-year-old son talks to her, it will only work if he says, please. <laughs> Alexa, please get my, you know, because one, one thing I find really interesting is if you hear kids like talking to Alexa, for example, they're often using this tone of voice that That's I do awesome. not like right. as a well, parent. And right? many of these, uh, these voice-based systems are defaulted to being uh, Female as well, mm -hmm. which carries another sort of interesting. But mm -hmm. but right, so so we should treat our machines more kindly. Alexis should say, nope, sorry, not doing that right now. <laughs> right, say so, it again more politely. Yeah. <laughs> so if we can solve this problem, so I'm not 100% convinced that we've solved this prop technical challenge yet of getting machines to accurately recognize how we're feeling because a big problem could arise. So there's a whole body of research showing that and Nick is an expert in this, that people don't necessarily understand each other very well. So now we think, oh, machines will understand us. And so what could be a potentially quite problematic is if we now think that you know, machines, we can build these machines that will understand us, but actually they misunderstand us. So they are responding to their assumptions about our emotional state mm -hmm. that are totally off. Yeah. And if, um I'm wondering if, if machines aren't great at understanding where we're coming from just by listening to us, is part of that because what humans glean from voice conversations with one another is largely based on sort of not the, the vocal parts, like the pauses, um, where you might stumble. I, is that where most of the meaning resides, or at least a significant portion of it? That's where the inferences about mind come from we find. So it's in the paralinguistic cues yeah. that are contained in the voice. In particular, like I can't, I can't see your mind, I can't see you thinking, I sometimes see you feeling, but lots of you are feeling lots of different things right now and none of you are showing any of it to me. You're all giving me mostly a bank expression except for that guy who's given me a nice smile. Um, <laughs> Thanks for and, that guy. <laughs> and so I can't see your mind, but, but we, we do find that you can sort of hear it or at least you think you can hear it and it comes through the paralinguistic cues that I actually think are fairly honest signals of conscious experience as they're happening. We haven't been able to study accuracy quite yet, but intonation is one. And in intonation is variance in tone. So it's the standard deviation of the pitch on your voice. That's the statistical calculation of it. So your voice rises and falls in pitch. You also speed up and slow down. And so you can tell that somebody's thinking when they pause for a minute to think, and then they pick back up again. You can tell when somebody's pretty excited because they speak more quickly and then slow down. And so it's the paralinguistic cues that show up. And none of that's visible in text, per se. It's all stripped out of that. And also, Alexa isn't listening to any of I mean, Alexa's just taking your audio and, and, and kind of lex, you, you know, converting it to the, lex, the actual words you're saying. Alexa, at the moment, does not consider the paralinguistic feature. It could, and I think that's where the industry is going. So eventually it will listen, you know, it will kind of grab onto these. So what could a smart speaker do that's different than today if it could read these paralinguistic cues more precisely or at all? It could say, Adian, you sound really upset today or right. you sound really stressed today. Do you want to take five minutes to meditate? Right. Um, I'm doing fine, thanks. <laughs> that could, that really could be right. If it's not, yeah, I mean, it has to meditate. Yeah, yeah well, but That's exactly. So but, but a big part of, of, of this whole, even with vehicles, right? Like right. how the machine reacts back is going to be critical to building trust and not being frustrating and annoying. Yeah. Well, and I think the point that you make about trust is so important. And I think part of trust is feeling understood, right? Mm -hmm. Feeling like the machine understands me. And so I do feel like there's a risk of like leading consumers to think that the machines can now understand us when it's a hard problem. So there's this very classic study in social psychology where you put a few undergrads in the room together and then you, the experimenter leaves and then the room slowly begins to fill with smoke. So what do people do? They look around at each other. And what does everyone look like in this confusing potential emergency? They look like this, blank. 
nobody knows what's going on, right? And then they look to each other and they all interpret this blank cue as meaning there's no problem here, right? So I think, uh, and, and you can watch, you know, the, the room just gets real, real, real smoky before anyone leaves because of this problem. Whereas if you just have one person, room starts to fill with smoke, they get out of there. Mm -hmm. And so, this, so these, these potential problems of misperceiving each other's emotions, I think, are really important. And partly because, you know, if we do have someone stand up and do your best smirk or do your best smile, that's easy to read. That's an easy problem to solve. The hard problem is what are all of you thinking right now? That's what I want to know. What are all of you thinking? And it's really hard to tell from your current facial expressions what you guys are thinking. And we'll find out in a minute because we will go to questions. But before we do that, um, I, I wanted to ask, I mean, so all of this, this research and these new technologies are developing also at a time when the way that we relate to one another is seems to be profoundly changing because of technology. And I know, Liz, you've looked a lot at smartphones and sort of how the extent, I mean, I put it this way, I think you've brought a lot of nuance to a lot of the anxiety over smartphones while also um, showing that there are things that we should be maybe concerned about in terms of how we relate to our phones and how that affects how we relate to one another. Um, maybe you can talk a bit about the experiments you've done. Um, the the uh, mapping experiment I thought was particularly interesting. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, there is so much speculation out there about how our phones are affecting us. Probably a lot of you have theories about this. Um, and so um, what we try and do in my lab is actually alter people's behavior and then just see what happens. So uh, in one of our cities, for example, we wanted to pick a task that phones are really great at. So we asked people to go out on our campus and find a building that we knew they were unfamiliar with. And we either had them lock up all of their belongings in a cabinet, including their phones, or we had them lock up all their belongings, but we said, you can hang on to your phones, you know, so feel free to use your phones. Now, uh, it won't surprise you to learn, people got to the building four minutes faster when they had their phones than when they did not have their phones. Almost everybody did make it to the building, so people who say millennials can no longer get anywhere without their phones are wrong. Like, you can, they did eventually get there, it took them a little bit longer. Um, and, but interestingly, uh, they felt less socially connected by the time they arrived at the building if they had had access to their phone during uh, this task. And what we noticed is that when people uh, had to solve this problem, had to find this building without their, their phones, the typical student talked to three other people on our campus on their way to find the building. I will let you guys yell out, how many people do you think the typical person talked to when they had their phones? Zero, Zero exactly. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> so it basically cuts out these little interactions, which again, might seem uh, trivial, but it turns out that these small interactions that we have in everyday life can actually make a difference for our feelings of connection. Now, you know, that, there have been headlines about some of our work that are like smartphones are ruining our lives. So I just want to be clear, like overall, we actually saw people in the phone group, people who had access to their phones, were a little bit happier by the end than people who uh, did not have their phones. And the reason why is phones make things easy. People love easy stuff. Like easy is good, easy makes me happy. But this massive benefit that this convenience and ease um, provided was largely undercut by this loss of social connection. Mm -hmm. So one thing that tells us is that phones aren't just doing one thing. They're changing our lives in multiple ways at the same time that may partially cancel each other out and it may depend on the particular features of the situation whether the phone is really gonna hurt you or help you. And I know you said um, the, that millennials still figured out how to get there. Um, <laughs> but looking even farther to the future, do you see as we outsource more of our human to human work, our, the way that we communicate or, or connect with one another, as we outsource more of that to machines, do you, do you think that we'll end up forgetting how to have conversations or forgetting how to read facial cues? I mean, I know this may be unanswerable at this point, but I wonder what you see as sort of, in the same way that I'm sure a lot of us, or at least I'll speak for myself, I don't have the same number of phone numbers committed to memory as I once did. Um, what will we lose as machines do more of the work for us? So one thing that I'm worried about is that we'll lose things that we're not aware we're losing. So a lot of, you know, pretty, pretty much any time new tech comes on the scene, there's, there's a period of years where we fumble around with it until we figure out how to use it. So when, when cars were first built, they were deadly because we didn't design them with all sorts of safety features. Now they're pretty safe, uh, much, more, much safer than they used to be. Um, one concern I have about some of this tech, and in particular about the social consequences mm -hmm. of the tech, of the kind that Liz just mentioned here, is that it's not always obvious 
to us that we're losing those social effects, and hence the technology can't is not necessarily going to be designed to fix or to bring back some of those social costs. So it's obvious what efficiency gains we're getting. But if you and I text to each other, and I infer incorrectly that you're an idiot because I don't, re I don't, I don't connect with your mind in the same way as if we were talking, I would never find out that I was wrong. Mm -hmm. I'd just conclude you're an idiot, and we'd go on our merry way, and I'd never talk to you. I wouldn't find out that I, I wouldn't find out that I had just screwed up, essentially. If I lose these little moments of connection throughout my day that make me feel just a little less connected to human beings because I never talk to them anymore than I would have otherwise, I might be left feeling just a little isolated and disconnected from others. I wouldn't necessarily know why. And it's not clear to me that, that we have the ability right now to pick up these social forces that we're losing from tech in a way that would make them better. Well, and arguably it seems, and I want to go to Brian, but it seems like we might already be seeing some evidence of that with the polarization of mm -hmm. society. And um, did you have, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if, if, if you don't lose a muscle, it atrophies, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, if I, I worry, I have a 16 year old and a 10 year old son, and my son, you know, communicates, yeah, I, I worry about him not really learning about social cues in, in, in the way that I did, for example. But I think the solution is not to do away with technology, but to redesign technology in a way that accommodates how, to, how people communicate naturally through conversation, through emotions, through you know, perception, through empathy. We need to redesign technology in a way that you know, understands and, people. And you do see, I don't know, any number of you who have spent time with teenagers who have smartphones, there is this sort of new, yes, they may be um, spending time just looking at their phone by them, themselves, but you also see groups of teenagers get together all with their phones out, all looking at it and talking about it. So there is this new sort of social uh, dynamic that's emerging from this that I think, at least I certainly haven't figured out um, what it means or where it's taking us. Um, I'd like to take some questions before we bring our next panelists up and have these panelists take some questions. If anyone has a question, just sort of wave your hand. I see someone way back here. We'll have a mic um, come to you all the way at the back. Put your hand up again. Yeah, there you go. Great. Um, hello. Good afternoon. I really enjoyed this panel and the back and forth and the complimentary um, kind of approach that you have. But it was like I had in the back of my mind um, the kind of comparison to what you're saying here. You're designing AI that works in this world. Uh, but if I have it in the back of my mind, I have my region coming from the Middle East Africa. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, applicable in there. I mean, uh, if we score people on Twitter for like um, the bad mood that we can make, mm -hmm. it's not us, it's the news. So we're just reporting. I mean, um, reading the face is, is very complicated for us. It could be used against us in oppressive regimes. Absolutely. So you, as experts, leading, and I guess you're from the region, Yes. so how can we just have this technology but in our favor instead of having it used against us. It's very important to keep this in mind because you're shaping the future somehow and that's, uh, that has a lot of implications in there. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question, yes. And I, I, spent a lot of, I still spend a lot of time in the Middle East, um, both in Egypt and UAE, um, which, which as a country, UAE is, very, is on the forefront of deploying these AI technologies. And I have a lot of question marks around some of the use cases. But again, technology is neutral, right? It's how we decide to use it and who do we decide to put in control of this technology. That's a real important question. I mean, we, our two biggest competitors are two Chinese companies that do not share our core values around data privacy or consent or use of data or misuse of data. And that's, that's concerning. So how do we deal with that though once the technology is developed? I mean, I'm thinking about um, if you look at uh, synthetic video or the videos that are made that can make it appear as though someone has said something and they're quite convincing mm -hmm. at this point and getting more advanced all the time. Um, synthetic video in many cases was developed to make conference calls smoother so that if you lost connection, yes. the person's face wouldn't go away. Totally innocuous application. Now we're worried about you know people making deep fake pornography that portrays people without their consent that's not actually them or heads of state being portrayed to say things they haven't said that could potentially start a war. I mean, so once you've developed the technology, how do you prevent a, a, an oppressive regime or, or anyone else with bad intentions from using it? So I, th I think 
kind of the innovators, like society has a big role to play in that. Like consumers have to take a stance against these types of companies or regimes or governments, um, and that's going to put a lot of pressure on companies to ab you know, abide by these regulations. Um, we're part of a consortium called the Partnership on AI. It was started by the tech giants, but they've involved both startup, you know, startups as well as other stakeholders like Amnesty International and ACLU. And I think that's the right direction to, you know, people who are designing these technologies need to step it up and, and really kind of think about the implications. We could totally keep going on that, but I want to have here. other people have a chance to ask questions. Um, someone's going to run to you with a mic. <laughs> Thank you. This is so interesting. So I'm curious, is there anything in the pipeline with my smartphone that is like a voice text? Because I'm, you know, we all text. And like I text my daughter, but there's not the inflection in the voice. You know, like, Honey, call me. Honey, call me. Right. Um, <laughs> or, um, you know, just in, is there anything that would be like a voice text instead of just it, all this typing and emoji a thon? That I, I have on? an iPhone, and it can do that now. It has a phone. Yes. It has a yeah, phone on it. Phone. You can actually you remember after? when we used to use them this way. <laughs> Hi, Liz. I'm Nick. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, you can make a phone yeah. call. Yeah. You Hi, how so are you doing? But even with voicemail, you know, and I'm yeah. guilty of this. Yeah. I don't you can listen. send you know, an thing, audio. So I think I think the challenge though is getting people to use those yeah. things. I don't uh, the recipients. I, I don't know. I, I I think part of it's because you don't you can't tell what you're missing. But it's also important to note that technology is, is neutral, right? And we use them for lots of different things. Lots of what we use text for is communicating, communicating small bits of information. And that's fine with a short text. So right, if, if Liz wants to tell me where we're going to dinner tonight, she send me a quick note. Here's the address. Great. Send that to me in a text. Don't call me. I don't need your voice for that. But if Liz wants to tell me how things are going in her research these days and how she's feeling about it, she better not send me a 20-word you know, text. She better give me a call about it. So I mean, I think th from my perspective, the interesting thing about tech is, is our capacity to use it wisely or unwisely. And it's not obvious to me that we always know when we're using it unwisely. We think we can do it a lot. I don't have a great solution for how to do that, except we keep doing more research, find out what the facts are, help people become wiser a little faster than they would otherwise become. We have time for one more from this group. He's hiding behind. Oh, sorry, hi. <laughs> Uh, I have a question maybe building on the previous one about universality. Uh, so, Ronnie, uh, the Ekman research suggests that these cues are universal across culture. I'm curious if that's still the current view. And then on the paralinguistic cues, too, is that as universal? I mean, I grew up in Canada. The joke is everyone, every sentence is a question there, right? So um, how, how universal are these cues in different modalities? I'll, I'll tackle the facial expression one. Um, I'm a huge advocate of F Ekman's work mapping kind of the facial action coding system, which is mapping the facial muscles to these action units, essentially building an objective scoring mechanism for faces. I am quite... I'm not quite sure about the mapping of, these ex of his work around mapping expressions to like six universal basic emotions. Um, and I spent, in academia, I spent a lot of years like basically showing that there's a lot of other expressions and emotions that may or may not be universal. In our data, so we've analyzed these 8 million faces um, from 87 countries around the world, we found that by and large the expressions are universal, but there are cultural norms that depict when um, people either amplify an expression or dampen it or mask it altogether. And that's where the you know, the cross-cultural differences come into play. Is it play. true that Americans are smilier? We found that um, women, women in the US tend to smile more than men and 40% um, more than men in our data. Uh, and we did not find any Brits in the room. A few, no, no, okay, one Brit in the room. <laughs> we, we found no statistical difference between men and women in our data. Wow. In terms of how expressive they were, so that's that was really interesting. interesting. Yeah. All right, um, we do have time for one more if you'd like. And there's someone coming to you with a mic. All the gender guys both are in our Any one of us can disguise our look or our feelings or our expressions. To what extent can you detect that? And can you detect it in a world class actor? 
who, who plagues the role of somebody else. Which Our technology think? can't right now. We, we could do like micro expression, like light, but we do not do that. So, so our technology cannot. I'm not optimistic about micro expressions either. They don't <laughs> reveal honest yeah. emotion very clearly, except yeah. in really extreme cases. One, there's a huge literature on lie detection. Yeah. Um, people think faces convey whether you're lying or telling the truth. Turns out they don't well at all. The best way to find out whether somebody's lying or not is to ask them, are you lying to me right now? <laughs> Turns out to be the most effective way I've seen at least, the biggest effect size. Um, but no, and I think that's one real challenge for, mm -hmm. for accuracy from bodily expressions and facial expressions in particular. It's because we, we can fake it really easily, really well, and it's very hard to detect as an observer. Mm -hmm. It's possible AI could, could get there. I don't, I would, I'm, I'm skeptical about it. I, I would have to see the data on that, mostly because our, our bodily expressions evolve to lead as well as mislead other people with what we're feeling. We use them for both. Great. On that note, what do you, so what do you use as your kind of ground truth? If you're seeing somebody smile, do you know that they're actually feeling happy or could it no, just be they're just being polite? Smile. We just, we just label for smile. Okay, so you yeah. can't say, you can't go from they're smiling to they're actually happy. You just know that they're smiling. Correct. That's what I was thinking about that too. Right. With the uh, if American women are smiling more, how much of is, is that is Polite happiness social. versus norms that may say women should you know women hear that all the time they should smile. So, um, social so norms. Great work by Ann Kring, who's a psychologist at Berkeley, who looked at stereotypes about men and women. Men are presumed to be uh, less emotional than women. That's the stereotype. And so what she did was she put men and women in front of emotionally evocative films, recorded them physiologically. You can detect emotion, uh, emotion from a, a few uh, physiological signals, heart rate variability and skin conductance were the two that she looked at that I remember, uh, as well as just ask them, self-report, how happy and sad the movie made them feel. Then had observers watch videos of the men and women watching the videos, so sort of meta, meta, meta movie. So I'm watching you watch the video. And what they found was no difference in the emotional experience between men and women, but a significant difference in emotional expression. So men and women reported feeling the same, their physiological responses looked the same on average, but women tended to smile more, show their emotion a little more than men did. That led observers who were watching you to believe that women actually were experiencing more emotion than men were when in fact it was just about your expression. So we could do a whole panel complex. on that. That's yeah. fascinating. Well, thank you. Um, don't stand or stand up in a moment, but carefully. I think you're exactly. plugged into your mics. But in the meantime, I will um, bring up the next panelist. We have Neil Leibowitz, a psychiatrist and the chief. Met oh yeah, thank you. Please, yes, thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, we have Neil Leibowitz, a psychiatrist and the chief medical officer of Talkspace, and joining him is Nancy Lublin, the co-founder and CEO of Crisis Text Line. They'll make their way up. Um. Thank you both for being here. So we have talked about faces and voices and a little bit about text, and we're going to move a little bit more into the world of, of text-based communications now. Um, you both largely focus on text and how it can remove barriers to communication. And I wonder, um, Nancy, maybe you can start by talking about why it's important to, to give people the ability to text uh, when you know they might not be speaking or seeing each other face to face. We are about to be the defenders of text. Yes. <laughs> I feel a little bit like the teenagers who come up after people like said Elvis gyrates too much. <laughs> I'm a writer, so I'm here for text. <laughs> right? Like text, text, there's text so many great. good things about text. I'm going to make you all very happy that you're paying your kids cell phone bills. <laughs> um, because it turns out um, text is fantastic. Um, for some specific things, like for what we both do, text is a fantastic way to say things that you're not comfortable saying to someone's face or by voice. 66% uh, of people who text us at Crisis Text Line share something they've never shared with another human being. So, so talk about this a little, because this yeah. is surprising to me that people would be willing to commit to text, to commit to writing their deepest secrets or their most difficult struggles, especially to someone they don't know. So Crisis Text Line is strangers, uh, counseling strangers in their, their most dire moments. So it's not therapy. Um, crisis text line is in that heat of the moment. 
And, um, and so it's people coming out for the first time. It's people saying that they have suicidal thoughts for the first time. Um, and um, there's a veil of ignorance. So there's no assumption about age or race. There's no judgment. You don't hear someone gasp. <gasps> oh my gosh, how could that be happening to you? You don't hear any judgment in a voice. Um, it's really straight up fact. You don't get crying. You don't get repetition. You don't get the word um. um it's uh, fact and feeling and emotion from the texters and from our crisis counselors. It's validation, unconditional love, strength, and in, in your realm, Neil, it, it's similar, but not in, necessarily in such a dire moment for people. So the original texts are letters. Yep. And people communicated for centuries with letters. And I even remember reading my grandfather's memoirs. And he was never able to communicate the way he did there. He was never able to tell the stories. And we finished recently a study on post-traumatic stress. And what we found was the dropout rate was much lower. And the real reason is, is because people coming in and having that veil where they can communicate on their terms makes them comfortable. I used to wait eight weeks, 10 weeks when I was practicing more for someone to share things that people are saying to us within a week. Third message. Third message, they've spilled their guts to us. Is that, and that's the like, you've looked at all of the data and that's the average? 110 or? million messages we've processed. We're about six years old. By the third message, on mm -hmm. average, people have told us exactly what's going on. I just lost my job, and I don't know how I'm going to uh, pay my mortgage. Um, uh, I'm being bullied at school, and I can't go back there tomorrow. I mean, by the third message, they've spilled to us what's going on. And it's, it's remarkable that you can even find that kind of pattern. So, And I know this is something you're both thinking a lot about, this data-driven approach to mental health. What is it when you have an aggregate, um, you know, you have all of this data in aggregate, what can you learn about how people are doing, not just at the individual level, but as a society or in certain demographics that we couldn't previously? So we have, I mean, it's a baseline, right? And so, um, so we have been able to learn things that make us faster and more accurate. So faster, we stack rank the queue based on severity. We don't want your kids to die anymore from suicide, okay? Suicide is 100% preventable, 100% preventable. And so my goal is to get to those kids who are at imminent risk as quickly and as accurately as possible. And so uh, when we first launched, we put a few words into the algorithm that we knew would be high risk, like suicide, die, overdose, gun, and saw that we could take our high risk people in about two minutes. High risk are people who have the ideation, the plan, the means, and the timing to commit harm to themselves or, frankly, to someone else. We see about one to two homicidal texters a day. That's, they're mostly school shooters. Um, sometimes it's mall bombings, and sometimes it's partner homicide. But, um, and with those instances, we call 911. So we have a baseline. When we hit about 20 million messages in our corpus, we looked and we said, when do we really call 911? What are the n-grams, bigrams, and trigrams? What are the words and word combinations when we actually have to call 911, where we can't get you to a, a happier place, where we can't yet get you to put the pills in a drawer or put the gun away? Um, and it turns out there are thousands of words and word combinations that are more lethal than the word suicide. So um, the word military, twice as likely that we will have to call 911 than the word suicide. If you text in and say, I'm in the military, Twice as likely we're going to have to call 911 than if you text in and say, I want to commit suicide. So how Unhappy you... face crying emoji is four times as likely that we're going to call 911. And the most lethal words in America are any named pill. So how do you handle that? I, I know you say you call 911 when you think someone, when you believe someone might harm themselves. But how do you take 120 million messages, however many, how do you convert that into action that actually can save people's lives? So we stack rank the queue in real time. So we use AI, like these guys use AI. And so um, we function like a hospital emergency room. If you show up at the hospital emergency room with a heart attack, they're going to wheel you right in and make the kid with the sprained ankle wait for half an hour. That's OK. My son in his soccer sprained ankle, he can wait for half an hour while they take the heart attack or the gunshot wound. A hotline should work the same way. We should take the high risk people immediately. Um, and so now, thanks to machine learning and AI, and all that natural language processing, we take those high-risk cases in 22 seconds. 
So I don't want to get too into the technical weeds, but I do want to get a little into the technical weeds. Is this um, the natural language processing you're doing? Is it semantic analysis that's trying to judge words based on how positive or negative they are? Or sort of describe the methodology a little bit more in depth. So it's similar to what we heard before. There's a baseline. We can see what are the words where we in conversations where we have had to call 911, and it updates in real time. And so the algorithm gets smarter the more volume, velocity, and variety that we have. What are, I know you mentioned military, names of specific uh, drugs. What are some of the other words that have emerged that surprised you? Well, let me say good ones. Yes, Because that please. was miserable, so let me say good things. There are <laughs> words that also can tip people to a positive place. Um, so smart, proud, brave, impressive. These are really good words to use um, with people um, who are in a hot moment. Um, so uh, we should just all be saying that to our kids all the time. That was a really smart decision you made. That's a really impressive choice. Wow, that was really impressive that you could share that with me. Um, anxiety is on the rise with young people in America. The antithesis to anxiety we see is the word strong. What makes you feel strong? Tell me what makes you feel strong. For most of them, by the way, it's music. Um, so uh, we talk a lot about music. Um, the other thing we hear a lot about with anxiety is sleep. 21% of our conversations explicitly mention sleep. Young people in America are just not sleeping. Um, and that's a problem. So how does this all apply to, into the therapy realm? I mean, it sounds like in both of your cases, you're potentially reaching entire populations of people who might not have ever accessed care before. Um, how does that play out in your, in your so, field? Who here knows what the mode number of therapy sessions that occur? What, what, or the number of average number of sessions? I'll take either answer. For someone going into therapy, one, one. What Most people go to therapy Trans. once and never show up again. And the average number of completed sessions is less than two. So we're not getting to people. And the question is, how do we get to people? And how do we get to them quickly? So one of our goals is, can we give therapists the tools to make them better therapists? We believe strongly in the concept of the practitioner, of the therapist, but we want to help them. We want to tell them when they're going to lose someone before they know they're going to lose someone, what their risk of the discontinuation is. And we've looked at that. And what can you do when someone's at risk of discontinuation? We have the ability to send audio and video messages as well. Maybe for this person at this time, a video message will save them. Maybe talking about something else will save them. Maybe some diagnostic intelligence looking at the millions of messages will tell us that yes, we thought they had an anxiety disorder. They're diagnosed with it. But there's something there that's a post-traumatic stress that's triggering that algorithm to say, consider it. We would never do it, but we want to give them those tools to see something perhaps a couple of weeks, days, months before they do, and if they can keep people in treatment, we're already making a difference. The number needed to treat, the number of weeks generally looked at to get someone well is between eight and 12 sessions. So we're looking at two and three months. And when you hear that most people are in treatment one to two weeks, we're really failing. So what can we do to do that? And whatever it is, if it's face-to-face, -face, I'm for it. If it's digital, I'm for it. But it's really about getting to people. I, I think this is a fantastic solution. I, just to be clear, this is not like a paid endorsement. We've never met. <laughs> but I think this is a fantastic solution because for the most part, if you want to be in therapy, you have to be available. You've got to be sort of near a therapist, like in a city for the most part, and available during business hours. And um, that's hard for a lot of people. And this puts it in your pocket. I, just, I think it's super smart. Um, it's not what we do. but. Yay. <laughs> I think it's super smart, too. <laughs> yeah. um, so in both cases, there, there's, as with the other conversation we had, there are substantial privacy questions that emerge. You have these reams of data, including messages of people confessing their deepest secrets and worries, things that conceivably could be used against them by employers or in custody battles. Um, how do you think about, well, first of all, how do you protect that data? So. Um, we, before we even launched, we spent a lot, well, there are so many lawyers on my board, like I did that on purpose before we launched. And we built to the European standards before GDPR was a thing. I mean, we just said, what are the toughest privacy standards in the world, let's build to that. So we built to those standards from the get-go, so that, that's one thing. But um, look, we're a not-for-profit. Um, I'm not here to make money, um, much to my parents' chagrin. So um, that was funny, by the way. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. I'm Jewish. My parents are very upset with me. Okay? I didn't become a doctor, I didn't become a lawyer, and I married a man with the last name Diaz. I'm really I'm not doing very well. impressed. But anyway, you're smart, you're I'm brave, just trying we're to proud. Make, we're I smart, exactly. Doctor okay, lawyer. good, okay, good. Different. Be my friend and we're good. Okay, so anyway, um, um, but I'm like a, anyway. I'm, okay, so. Um, <laughs> I think therapy um, is happening right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm not even texting you. So, um, I, we, privacy, I'm, I'm here just to help people. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, we're not here to, to make any money. I'm really just here to help people. So there's, there's two things that Crisis Text Line is all about. How do we get to people, and they skew young, poor, rural, and diverse. So these are people who don't have access to help other ways. How do we get to those people as quickly and as, with the highest quality possible? And, um, and it's all free. Uh, it, we don't even pay texting fees, and the texters don't pay fees. And we don't even show up in texters' bills. So there's total anonymity. Um, and then the second thing is, how do we learn? How do we, how do we get this data together? I would love if you, if, uh, some of the researchers who are up before this, like we've opened up Enclave um, access. There have been five papers published so far. There are 10 more coming in the next 12 months. Um, we want to fuel really smart learnings based on this data corpus. We're just here for the public good. And so so if we're here for the public good, privacy should be the most important thing. I'm, I, um, I just want to, I just want to make the world better. <laughs> Neil, how about you? Oh yes, that deserves a round of applause. Um, how about you? So, Is there ever a case when it's appropriate to share data from what you you um, learn or from what people s submit to your your system? So what's really interesting is we're moving into a new phase of data. It used to be someone would disclose my electronic medical record, my X-ray. Now they can disclose the treatment. And we've had a couple of really interesting cases or odd cases where, for example, I had one actually the other day where we got a complaint from someone's spouse saying that the other side, the husband in this case, was showing the wife the message. And she was very upset by what the therapist was saying. Now, what it was was a very clever screenshot that cut the post in half. And when you read the first two sentences, it says something. When you read the rest, it makes sense and it's very ethical. And we had this person who said, and it was really being used as a weapon of marriage destruction, perhaps, dare I say. And we're moving into this realm where now people have not only their medical record, now they have the record of treatment. Yeah. It's dangerous. As a company, we will fight never to turn that over. That is the treatment. That is not the medical record. And we have been subpoenaed. We have never turned it over. We have no intention on turning it over. And we'll take it as far as it'll go. As a lawyer, I did some case, I did look. And there is no corpus of law that really addresses a lot of these modern day issues. And the states are way behind, not their fault. It's as to be expected. And we're going to need to figure out, as we have different types of information and data, what the regulatory environment will look like and how that'll work. And honestly, it's not only ethical, but it's also in our interest. We don't want this disclosed. We want people to feel safe in treatment. Because once that treatment record comes out, it's done. That veteran with PTSD, they're not coming in if they feel that that, that is going to be exposed. The, the limit, though, is we believe that your life matters more than your privacy. And that's not the case for, for every hotline around the world. But we believe that if you're at imminent risk, um, we de-encrypt. And we call 911, and because um, and, we think your whole life could change tomorrow, especially all these young people. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's when your privacy goes out the door. You're threatening harm to someone else or to yourself, and it's imminent and credible, and there's a, an, a, a, the imminent time frame. Um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to send help. We're going to take questions in just a moment. Um, last question for me. Given all of the aggregate data you have, given how much time you've spent looking at how people communicate, what is your sense, and this is a big question and maybe too big, but what is your sense of how people are doing and how that's changing? I know we hear a lot about young people with more anxiety than ever. Um, should we be optimistic? If not, why not? I mean, how are people doing? It doesn't look good. <laughs> I thought you were an optimist. I'm the pessimist. So. I, I, I definitely have concern, and it's funny. I actually, we do work with colleges, and we have this cottage industry where we do work with fraternities. So they asked me to speak. And one of my messages is you need to talk to people, not just to a therapist. 
and you need to talk to your parents. You need to talk, maybe, it didn't go over that well, I think, with some. You need to talk to your pastor or your rabbi or your religious leaders. You need to turn to your friends. And yes, a professional is very helpful. Yes, a crisis counselor is very helpful in their situations. But I think people are coming to us more because they're lacking that. And we need to move back to that. And I'd rather if people talk to their parents than sign up for us. There are enough people who need help that we can afford to lose plenty of people if they're going to their community for help. And that, to me, is really the major way we're going to make this better. It's, um, it's not good. Um, I, I, I didn't come to this from mental health. I come to this as a tech startup person. Um, and I also went to law school, but we don't like to talk about that. Um, and, <laughs> you both did. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, it's bad. So 15% of our texters right now um, indicate they're under the age of 13. They don't even all have phones. So to have such a huge chunk of middle schoolers texting us, but here's the kicker. 20% of them, without us asking, with them just self-disclosing, 20% of those middle schoolers indicate that they're self-harming. They're cutting. Um, cutting is the new eating disorder. Um, I remember eating disorders. Um, cutting is, it's just alarming, and there are not lots of organizations, lots of research, lots of talk about it, and we don't even see it. You, you could see the person with the eating disorder, you could see it in their physical appearance, you could see it in the way they reacted to food. You're not seeing, your kids are covering their legs with jeans and with long sleeves, and you don't, you're not seeing the self-harm. The self-harm numbers are, um, are very disappointing and scary to me. Also because most of them say that it is a form of self-care. They, they are not, they say it's how they process emotion and how they feel. So they don't think that it's a problem. Um, the anxiety numbers are incredibly alarming um, and going up. A third of everyone who texts us references social media. So I think there is there's definitely something going on there. Um, um, if you want, we have aggregated and anonymized all of our data. You can look at it um, at crisistrends.org. It updates about every 30 seconds. Um, one of the most interesting things are the word clouds at the bottom. So you can see, like, anybody else here from Connecticut? I'm from Connecticut. We're the number one anxiety state. Oh, no. Um, and um, yay, number one. Um, uh, again, I'm funny. I know it's a hard topic. Um, but there's a whole bunch of, you can see all of this aggregated data. The one that really kills me, and I'm a mother of two teenagers, is every single word cloud. It's the top 35 words, and there's one word that shows up in every issue, and it's mom. On that happy note, <laughs> should we take some questions? We're running out of time, but I want to make sure to get to you guys. Um, seems like someone over here in stripes. The mic will make its way to you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to hear more about your statement uh, when you mentioned that suicides are 100% preventable. Um, this is, it's self-inflicted. It's the result of a terrible disease of depression or of an in-the-moment decision, um, but it's, um, it's, present, it's preventable. Um, here's the most interesting thing that we found in our, in our research, in our data, um, is how to, that it's never harmful or suggestive to ask. Um, you might have seen the memes on Facebook, like, I've always got a kettle on. Have you seen that one? The kettle's on, and you can always come and talk to me. Um, I'm here for you. Those are all I statements. The thing that we found in our data is asking a you statement um, um, and the way to ask it, so the timing and the way to ask it, to ask it early in the conversation um, and to ask it with an expression of care. I'm concerned about you. Um, I need to ask, are you thinking about killing yourself? And it's the words killing yourself or are you thinking about death and dying? Don't say the word suicide, necessarily. And that that's the most effective way to ask. And by asking, it's not harmful or suggestive. You're letting someone be seen. You're showing them that you recognize the depth of their feelings. Um, that's not to say that um, it's on each of us to save the person next to us. That's not what I mean when I say it's 100% uh, percent, uh, percent preventable. Um, what I mean is that it's, not, it's, a, it's an incident that could have been avoided. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's on each of us to save the person next to us. It's on ourselves to reach out for care. Um, um, to make more resources available. It's too hard to get mental health care in America. It's too expensive still. Um, um, and we need more cures for some things that really should have been cured a long time ago. 
Other questions? Right up front. Rana. <laughs> Here, just wait for the mic. One sec. Why do you think some people actually text you and some others don't? Like, um, well, what makes somebody, I mean, somebody has these suicidal thoughts or, you know, homicidal well, thoughts? We see what? everything. I mean, we see all the things. Um, and like I said, they skew young, poor, rural, and diverse. So young, 75% of our texters are under the age of 25. That's how they communicate. They text. Um, um, uh, poor, they don't have access to other things necessarily. If you take the nation, by the 10% the poorest um, area codes in America, that 10% uses 19% of our volume. Um, rural, you can again map that by area code. And diverse, 19% of our texters identify as Hispanic, 12% black, and 5.5% Native American, which is pretty amazing because only 1.5% of America is Native American. Um, look, I would like every solution to be available. When you can have a Tupac Shakur hologram counsel you, let's do that. I mean, it should be easier to get help than avoid getting help. Phone, drop-in centers, it's a, it's a crisis. Suicide is up 33% in America since 1999. Every single person in this room knows someone who died by suicide. All of us know someone. And um, it's still too hard to get help. Want to get help? These people the want to get help, so yeah, they're texting yeah, us, and yeah. so, which is interesting. And maybe not the, everybody wants to get help. Well, and maybe the implication, the, the sort of question you're implying is, how do you reach the people who aren't reaching out themselves? I think you have to make so, it as easy as possible. So the data is most people that have reached out, almost everyone who has a completed suicide, has reached out to some healthcare provider in the last month or two. That's what the data says. Whether it was recognizable or not, I don't know. People are reaching out. We're not always equipped or know. Sometimes we miss it. It's not a, it, it's out of beneficence, but we're missing it. We have time for one more question. Or, or both of you ask them and we'll combine <laughs> them. Um, I don't know who's easier for the mic to get to, but we'll, we can try to get to both. You said that you would call 911. How, how much information do you have when you get to that point? The idea is you, you have a phone and a person on the continent. Okay, so. and what was your question? We'll see if we can find it. <laughs> My question is on data sharing. Um, accuracy, accuracy can be brought to uh, a patient's healthcare if the data is shared and there's historic data uh, between healthcare institutions. How does that work with um, the technology that you provide um, between ther so therapists, you, for example? And, and just quickly, um, once uh, data is encrypted and it's given to emergency organizations, does that data then belong to them and it could be used in court in that's a great question. So we don't share data unless there's um, a, a legal request for it, um, including we have had uh, police officers who just happen to be the parents of someone texting in, try and get a transcript, and we were like, no, you've got to go get actual documentation. Um, for 911, what do we share with them, and how does this work? First of all, and I say this everywhere because I think 911 operators are some of the greatest people ever. They're amazing, amazing people. And so I always want to point out that there are actually 6,500 911 offices in America. And maybe you heard me do this yesterday if you were there yesterday. But for the rest of you, do you know how 911 is funded? Local landline taxes. 911 is in big, big trouble. And it is America's first first responder. That is the front line of homeland security. 911 is critical. Um, so and should we all get landlines? <laughs> I, I still have a landline at home for that reason. Uh, I just want to contribute to them. Anyway, they're incredible people. What do we share with them? Um, uh, most of the time we don't get location data. We ask texters, where are you? We want to send help. And sometimes they don't know. Sometimes they're already incapacitated. Um, and so we do de-encrypt. And then some of what you see on the TV show Homeland is real. And they can geolocate um, through cell towers and, and locate people. It's hard to do in cities because the Z-access is not great yet. Um, and um, so the accuracy is not always perfect. Usually people are home, and usually home matches their cell phone bill. So those kinds of things are really helpful. Um, uh, but again, this is the kind of stuff that, that also needs improvement. And there are some companies working on it. And to the other question. We try to geolocate as well. So in a word is, that's its own, that needs its own panel. We are not where we want to be with data sharing with large health systems. We do what we can. We build within our program and share, but the healthcare community is not really anywhere near where it needs to be with data sharing. We're out of time. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you to our earlier panelists, and thank you to all of you. This is great.